Okay, welcome to the homotopy type theory electronic seminar talks. Um, the instructions are the same as usual, but I'll just repeat them in case there's anyone who hasn't been here for a while and needs a reminder. Um, so please keep your microphones muted unless you want to ask a question. And we do strongly encourage you to ask questions, try to make it as, as interactive as possible. Um, it's also great, it adds to sort of the community spirit if you can leave your video turned on and then we can see who else is attending and it, it makes it easier if you ask a question to, uh, to know who's speaking. So that would be great. Uh, the talk will last for about 60 minutes and then we have up to 30 minutes for questions after that. We will be recording the talk and then if Evan agrees, we will put it on our YouTube channel. channel. If you're actually watching this from YouTube, I also encourage you to watch uh, the next hottest talk live. That way you can participate in the discussion and ask questions. Um, and those of you who want to, to see updates to the YouTube channel can subscribe to it as well. Okay, so today's speaker is Evan Cavallo from Carnegie Mellon University, and his title is Internal Param Parametricity and Cubicle Type Theory. Thanks, Evan. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the introduction, and thanks, Dan and Chris, for uh, running this. It's uh, been great to watch, and hopefully it will be great to uh, do as well. Um, so, uh, indeed, I'm Evan Cavallo, and I'm going to be talking to you today about internal parametricity and cubicle type theory. Uh, this is work that I've done with Bob Harper. And uh, before I talk about what any of this is going to mean, I just want to uh, know where this is coming from. So there have been a, a series of papers on internal parametricity by um, Bernardi and collaborators uh, beginning in maybe 2012, depending on where you consider it to have started. Um, and then more recently, there's uh, also been some work by uh, Andreas Neitz and others on a, a similar system. And then this January, uh, Bob and I uh, put up this um, preprint on combining this internal parametricity with cubicle type theory. So maybe about the first half of my talk is going to be about things that are in uh, these existing papers. And then in the latter half, I'll sort of begin talking about things that we did. Uh, so my goal with this talk is sort of to give you an idea of what internal parametricity is and what it has to do with higher dimensional type theory, uh, specifically cubicle type theory. So um, I guess that maybe many of you have uh, heard about this work and heard that it had some kind of relationship with the development of cubicle type theory, but maybe you don't know much about it, or if you're not from a programming languages background, you don't know what parametricity is. So uh, hopefully I can get some of that across to you today. So uh, let me then start by talking about what uh, parametric means. Um, so on an intuitive level, um, parametric being parametric is a property that a polymorphic function can have. So a polymorphic function or polymorphic term is uh, a, a type that has some type variables in it. And so here, um, this first one, you might call the polymorphic identity function. So it can take something of any type and produces something of the same type. And then the, the second example, something that takes in two terms of any two types and produces something of the first type by returning the first one. And uh, what's common of all these examples is that they're sort of, their behavior is uniform in the type variable somehow. So what they do doesn't depend on on what that type variable happens to be instantiated with. And so that is intuitively what is meant when one says that one of these functions is uh, parametric. And then the uh, sort of opposite adjective is ad hoc. So uh, an ad hoc polymorphic function is one that uh, maybe does something different depending on uh, where you're applying it. So this function here uh, is usually the identity function, but if you happen to apply it to a Boolean, it's just gonna return true. So that's somehow not uniform. And so that intuitive concept uh, was first made sort of uh, um, formal in some way by John Reynolds in uh, 1983. And so he introduced this definition that roughly says uh, a family, a type index family of functions is parametric when it preserves on or acts on relations. So as an example, if we're looking at this, this type here, x arrow x, where x is a type variable, then we'd say that a function of this type is parametric when given any two sets and a relation on them, if you take two things which stand in the relation, 
and apply the function at the appropriate types to those things, then you get back out two things which still stand in that relation. Um, and so that's a particular case for this x arrows x, but you can say what this means at, at any particular type. And then Reynolds abstraction theorem says that if you take a, a term that you can write in the simply type lambda calculus with some doodads, um, and you interpret it as a set theoretic function, then it's always going to be parametric. And this makes some intuitive sense. Um, in the lambda calculus, there's no sort of type case operator that lets you see what type you're at. So anything you're able to write down there is going to be parametric. And this um, property is, is quite strong. So for example, if I have a, a parametric uh, function of this type that satisfies this property, I can actually show that it has to be the identity function. The only thing that I can do that's sort of uniform is just to spit out what I've been given. Um, and you can probably taste the flavor of Yoneda here. Um, but something I want to point out is that because this is all about relations rather than functions, we can also say um, things about types that are less covariant, so to speak. So for example, if I have a, a function of this type, which takes in some endo function on a type X and spits out another one, well, that has some definition of what it means for that to be parametric, which you need not read. Um, but a consequence of that is that it has to essentially take the function it's given, compose it with itself some number of times and spit that out. So this kind of thing is, is useful uh, essentially for you know, getting some properties of functions, polymorphic functions for free. It's a, a kind of a slogan, call these theorems for free. Um, and so the, the question that Bernardi and his collaborators looked at was, if we're in, oh, not up to that yet. Um, okay, so the key idea of, of Reynolds abstraction theorem is that the lambda calculus has not only a set theoretic interpretation, but a relational interpretation. So, you know, you have this set theoretic interpretation where if you assign a set to each variable that occurs in some type expression T, then I can interpret T as a set where I sort of plug in those sets in each of the type variables. But there's also a relational interpretation. So if I instead have an environment of relations, assign a relation to each variable in T, then I can interpret T as a relation and it's a relation on the interpretation of T at the first component of this environment and the interpretation of T at the second component of this environment. And so that, if I apply it to a type, will tell us what it means for something to be parametric in that type. And um, so the definitions... Excuse me, before you go on, are, are the relations... Hold on. I, I can't hear you very well. Are these relations... Uh, I'm just a little confused about what E is. Is that mm -hmm. a function... Or what, the, what is the codomain of E? So the, like, um, uh, the class of relations. B between any, so a pair is consisting of two sets, A and B, and a relation between A and B? Yeah, I guess I've been a little loose in, in what I mean here. Yeah, but. Something like that? I'm not going to use this very uh, concretely in the future, but yeah, you could think of it that way. Okay. Um, and so, for example, if I, I interpret a type variable, well, that's going to just look up that variable in the environment and return that relation. And um, if I have a function type, what that's going to say is two functions are related in this relation. If whenever I, I plug in two things that are in the domain relation and apply the functions to them, uh, f on the left and g on the right, then I'll get out two things that are in the codomain relation. And so that gives me an interpretation of types. And then the, the content of the abstraction theorem is essentially that that uh, interpretation extends to terms. And so that will tell me that um, if I have a, a term in the lambda calculus and I interpret it, it will provide a, a witness to one of these relations. And that eventually tells me that, uh, that any term I can write down in the lambda calculus is, is parametric in the sense. OK, so now what I was saying before, um, the, the project of Bernardi et al. was to um, try to internalize this relational interpretation in dependent type theory. So you can uh, extend this, this kind of 
uh, interpretation from simply type lambda calculus or whatever along to any number of different more complicated systems, including dependent type theory. Um, and so the question was, can we take that and make it available inside the type theory? Um, a project which maybe sounds a lot like the project of internalizing univalence, a feature of the higher dimensional interpretations of type theory. Um, and then another way of putting it is, can we give an operational account of parametricity? So this is sort of a, a denotational account so far, but can we um, observe that this is constructive and, and say, what's the thing in type theory that corresponds to this thing in, in mathematics? Um, and so certainly, if I have some, uh, some terms inhabiting one of these uh, a polymorphic types, I can um, write down its relational interpretation inside dependent type theory as well. So it'd be something like, if I have any pair of types and any relation on those pair of types, then uh, if you give me a relation, then it sends it to a relation, et cetera. What I was saying before, essentially. Um, and so in prior work by Bernardi, uh, Janssen, and, and Peterson, they uh, explained how to, um, how to write down in general the interpretation of types and terms independent type theory, but the, the real big question is whether that function, the interpretation function itself, can be internalized in the type theory. So you want to have some operator inside there where you, you plug a type into it and it spits out this relational interpretation. Okay. Um, and so to talk about how they accomplish this, I'm going to start with something that will be more familiar to you, namely cubicle type theory. So. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about cubicle type theory in great detail because I think we've all, uh, or many of us, have been watching a lot of talks about cubicle type theory in the past. Um, so I'll just try and uh, fix notation and remind you what's going on. Uh, we're taking the judgments of type theory and adding in this context of interval or dimension variables. So I'm writing these as, as x's, and x here is each of these x's here is allowed to occur in gamma, m, and a. So this context is sort of the, the first one. Uh, sorry that it's at the end. Um, and so by making different choices of what the category of dimension context is, we get out a couple of different variants of cubicle type theory that people have worked on. So um, without saying too much, uh, if you have faces, degeneracies, and, and permutations, for dimensions, then this gives you the uh, Bizem, Kokan, Huber uh, model in cubicle sets, which you could sort of translate into a type theory. Um, if you add to that diagonals, you get the Cartesian cubicle type theories, which uh, have been developed by Anjuli Favonia Harper and Anjuli Brunery Kokan Favonia Harper Kata. Um, and then if you add connections and also reversals, then you get the uh, uh, Cohen, Kokan, Huber, Mortberg. Um, cubicle type theory. So there are a bunch of different options there, but in any case it looks something like this and the fact that everything is supposed to respect the equality given by things varying in dimension variables is ensured by these con operations that give you like the fact that equalities compose or can be inverted and that uh, you can transport across them. And finally univalence is ensured by adding some certain kind of type that converts in some way equivalences to paths. And so in, in the BCH theory, these are the G types. And then in the, um, the other two theories, which I'll call structural because they have diagonals, um, you have either glue or V types. And those, are, those latter two are very similar, so I'll kind of treat them as the same thing. Okay, so that's cubicle type theory in a nutshell. Um, and now if we look at an example of, of some sequent I might write down in cubicle type theory. If I'm doing this in an empty dimension context, then it looks sort of exactly like it would in ordinary type theory. I have some here, uh, a type, a point in the universe. I have a point which inhabits that type and it's spitting out some uh, term in a type. And these things are all kind of points, zero dimensional things. But now if my dimension context has a dimension variable in it, then everything is a line in that dimension. So I've got a line in the universe between two types, x0 and x1. And I have a line inhabiting that line, which is to say something over that line of types. 
A going from A0, which lives in A0, to A1, which lives in A1. And I'm spitting out, again, a line over a line of types. And in particular, because we have univalence, these lines of types correspond to equivalences. So here, I've got this equivalence x between x0 and x1. And I have these terms a0 and a1, which, are, which correspond to each other over the equivalence x. Um, so when we look at this, it, it looks sort of a lot similar to what, we're, uh, what we saw earlier in the relational interpretation of functions. I've, I've got a, a, a map sort of from things over, in this case, an equivalence, but I might think of a relation to things over another equivalence or relation. Um, so then we can ask ourselves, can we do something like this for relations? And that is exactly what uh, Bernardi et al. did. Um, it's most visible in their uh, most recent paper, the, the Priestier model paper. Um, but the idea is kind of present in the earlier ones as well. Um, and so the setup is basically the same. We've got a judgment, typing judgment, now in a context of what uh, they call colors and which I'll call bridge variables. The, that terminology is, um, is introduced by Noitz et al. Um, and uh, what in particular I want to stress is that we're going to use the BCH uh, interval structure. So where you have faces, degeneracies, and permutations. So to go through what these mean type theoretically, by faces, that means that we can substitute 0 or 1 for any dimension variable. Actually, in the, in the prior work, they only have a 0, so it's sort of an interval with one point. But I think it will be easier for us to think of intervals with two points. So let's do that. Um, the one-point version corresponds to a, a kind of predicate version of parametricity instead of a relational version. Um, and then degeneracies are kind of silent. So if I have M and A, then it also makes sense in an extended dimension context. And finally, permutations we'll see in the type theory as a kind of limited substitution of variables for variables. And so what this says is that I can substitute a variable Y for a variable X if it is fresh in the term M where I'm substituting it. And by fresh, I mean that Y doesn't occur in M. So I can substitute a new variable for some X. You can think of that as, as swapping y and x. And in fact, I can swap any two things by first swapping one out for a fresh thing and then swapping the other thing in. Um, and so using that, I get all the permutations. Um, but what I can't do is substitute y for x if y already occurs in m. And that, that would be a diagonal substitution. So that's what we're trying to avoid. And we'll see why we're trying to avoid it as we go on. OK. So just like we can do with path types in cubicle type theory, we can internalize this judgmental structure. And so I'm going to call these bridge types. And uh, for our purposes, it will be important to uh, talk about dependent bridge types. So this is the case where the, the type that we're looking at bridges over itself varies in some dimension. So I have a line of types here, A, which varies in X. And then I have a term M0, which lives in the left endpoint of that line, and a term M1, which lives in the right endpoint of that line. And then I can form the type of bridges between M0 and M1 over A. And in my intuition where lines of types correspond to relations, I want to think of um, this type being inhabited as saying M0 and M1 are related by A. Okay. And then uh, just like with path types, I have introduction and elimination rules for these types. So if I have a, a term that varies in the dimension X, then I can abstract it to get a bridge between its two endpoints, M with 0 for X and M with 1 for X. And if I have a bridge uh, between some points, then that's sort of a, a function in the dimension variable, and I can apply it at some dimension term, which will be either a variable or 0, 1. Now, the one thing that is uh, different here from the structural case that you're probably more familiar with is that I can only apply this function, again, to a fresh dimension variable. And so the way that's expressed here is this uh, backslash r in the premise, uh, the second premise. So this is saying that P has to be typed in the context without R. So I've subtracted R from the context here. So I can apply P to any dimension that it doesn't already mention. Okay. And then there are a bunch of, uh, you know, beta, eta rules, etc. the things that you'd expect. And so that gives us our, our sort of relational interpretation of a type line A. So A is line, and then I read off 
its relation as its bridge type. And so what I'd like to know is that uh, if I look at bridge types in various compound types, they behave according to um, what our relational interpretation from the beginning says they would. And the particular case that I want to look at is function types. So in the Cartesian or structural cubicle type theories, the ones with diagonals, uh, we have this function extensionality principle, which says that a path over a function type corresponds to a pointwise path, uh, family of paths in the codomain. So uh, implicit here is that X doesn't occur in A. Um, but uh, so we have this function extensionality principle. And the way that it works is very simple. Um, I mean, we know that uh, formally function extensionality is a consequence of univalence, but there's actually a much simpler proof in cubicle type theory. And the idea is that a path type is a lot like a function out of the interval, right? And so on the left-hand side of this equivalence, I have a sort of a function from interval to A to B, while as, whereas on the right, I have a function from A to interval to B. So I can convert between these two things just sort of by swapping the order of binders. And so um, as I have here on the second line, I can take this, this function from interval to A to B and then just swap it to get a function from A to interval to B and vice versa. But the thing about this is that it relies on the structural nature of the interval. Uh, it doesn't work in BCH. Um, and uh, I don't really get, wanna get too much into how the judgmental apparatus works to deal with substructural variables, but I'll try and give you an, an, intu an intuitive idea of why. Um, so in the expression on the left, this lambda x, lambda a p, a is introduced after x. And what this means is that when we plug in something for a, it is allowed to mention x because x is already sort of in scope. So this uh, p varies over dimensions x and terms a that may mention x. On the right hand side, on the other hand, a is introduced first. And the consequences of this is that we can only apply things that uh, don't mention x um, for a. Uh, and so the, the two sides are quantifying essentially over uh, different, different domains. And so it's not possible to convert between them. It's possible to go one way from left to right, but not from right to left. But that's OK for us, because this isn't the kind of principle we're looking for. Uh, what we're looking for is this relational interpretation of function types. Um, so a, a bridge over ARB between functions should be a, a function which takes, to, which takes bridges over A between any A0 and A1 to bridges in B between the image of those things under uh, the functions F and G. And um, those two principles, this function extensionality and the other one, are equivalent if we're talking about a, a path type that satisfies a J principle. So you can kind of see how with singleton contractibility, you could convert between these two things. But um, our bridges aren't supposed to be a, a notion of equality. So they're not going to satisfy any kind of J rule. Um, but uh, so in BCH, you do get this function extensionality principle. And you can think of that as being a, a result of this other principle we're going to get plus the J that allows you to get from one to the other. OK, so let me talk about how we get this uh, equivalence that we're looking for in this substructural theory. OK, so this is what we want. And um, as with function and extensionality, one of the directions uh, is easy. So if I have a, something on the left here, or on the top, I guess it is, um, which is a, a bridge of functions, then I can get a function from bridges to bridges by essentially applying it pointwise. So I take in some bridge A bar over A, and then I pointwise apply this bridge of functions to the bridge of A's to get out a bridge of B's. OK, so that doesn't rely on, on the substructural nature of dimension variables at all. But in the backward direction, we'll have to. So for the reverse, we're starting with one of these functions from bridges to bridges and want to turn it into a bridge of functions. Uh, now, a bridge of functions is going to be some lambda expression where I introduce a dimension variable and then introduce some variable of type A, and then I want to produce something of type B. 
And intuitively, what I want to do is take this a, which varies uh, intuitively in x, and think of it as a, a bridge over a, because um, it's, it's, it exists in a context with a dimension variable. And something in a context with a dimension variable is supposed to be a bridge. Um, the problem is that here, we're, we're inside this context with x. Um, so we can't really see the whole extent of that variable. We only see the point at x. Um, Sorry, and what does the lambda with the 2 mean? Uh, so lambda 2 is the introduction form for bridge, um, uh, bridge types. So um, a 2 is just for like a directed interval. It's um, this, the second rule here. OK. Yeah, it's something entirely different from the regular lambda. It's not like uh, lambda squared or something. Um, OK. Uh, so kind of what we'd like to, to write here is to apply this function k to the left endpoint of a, the right endpoint of a, and the bridge formed by a in direction x. We kind of want to, to capture the occurrence of x in a. Um, so this doesn't quite make sense as I've written it. A is a variable, so x doesn't actually occur in A. It's just that we can substitute things for A in which x does occur. Um, and so what we kind of want to have is a, a delayed way of doing this that when something is substituted for A will give us these three uh, components, the, the zero side, the one side, and the, the bridge across. Um, and so again, I can't really get into exactly how that works without talking about how to do substructural type theory, and I don't really want to do that. But suffice to say, it can be done. Um, and so what this operator extent is, um, this is called, I think, uh, phi in the work of Bernard D. et al., is it's kind of a case operator on dimensions um, or a case analysis. So it's taking in this, this term a, and then it's casing on what the variable x is. So if x is 0, it's going to turn into f. If x is 1, it's going to turn into g. And if x is a variable, it's going to capture that variable, look at a as a bridge along it, and apply this function k to produce a bridge in g. OK. And um, so while I don't want to talk about exactly what it does, I do want to um, examine why having a substructural interval is so essential for, for doing this. And the reason is that the operation of variable capture is not stable under diagonal substitutions. And so can um, look here, if I have some term m, which varies in two directions, x and y, then I could um, abstract that variable x. And so I get uh, lambda x mxy. And then maybe I substitute y for x. Um, now, x is bound here, so that substitution doesn't see the x and doesn't do anything. Still have lambda x mx y. Uh, if, on the other hand, I were to substitute y for x first, then I would get m with y for y. And then if I abstracted x, I would get lambda x m y y. Uh, and so that is different from what I got going in the other direction. And so, this operation of abstraction is not stable, doesn't, um, is not natural, I guess, with respect to this kind of substitution. And uh, this is a diagonal substitution on the left because I'm substituting y for x in a term that already mentions y. Um, so if I want that operation to be stable under substitution, I have to exclude those kind of diagonal substitutions. And that's exactly what we're doing by using this substructural interval. Uh, and so it's a the picture is actually a little more complicated than this because I also have to think about the, the face substitutions where I substitute 0 or 1. And that's the reason why uh, back here the extent operator also has cases for when x is 0 or x is 1. Um, but that's not like an existential problem. It's just a little uh, thing. <laughs> um, okay. So that will 
work, we'll be able to define these functions back and forth, like I said, and actually prove that they're an equivalence. And so that will give us um, this characterization of bridges and function types that we were looking for. And the other big question is, what about the universe? Um, so what we have been thinking intuitively is that a, a bridge of types is a relation. And now we want to uh, get access to that, see that um, bridges in the universe do indeed correspond to relations. And uh, we, uh, I'm afraid, have been calling this principle relativity. Um, in uh, the, at the um, MRC the other year at, at Snowbird, um, we also considered uh, a property of this kind for directed type theory, uh, a universe in, in directed type theory. And there we called it um, directed univalence. But since our goal is not really uh, um, like infinity categories, but relations, uh, it seemed like an improper name. And we're not really sure whether it was right to call it a kind of univalence. So relativity is what we're stuck with. Um, so one of these directions I, uh, of this equivalence I've already kind of talked about, which is if I have a line in the universe, then I get a relation out of it by looking at bridges over it. So C, a line in the universe, um, then I have a relation which for A and B uh, is inhabited when there is a bridge over C from A to B. Now in the backwards direction, this is like the hard direction of univalence where you need to turn a bridge into a type. Uh, sorry, a relation into a, uh, a bridge in the universe. And so for that, just as we would introduce the uh, maybe glue types uh, in cubicle type theory, we're going to introduce a type which we call uh, gel types, um, which Bernard Diadol call psi. Um, and so this is going to do exactly what we need, take a relation on two types, R on A and B, and spit out a type which is varying in some direction r. Uh, now note that the relation r is not allowed to mention, uh, relation capital R is not allowed to mention this direction lowercase r. And so um, in this typing rule, there is a bit of essential substructurality because in, with diagonal substitutions, you can't really talk about a term not mentioning a dimension that's not stable under substitution. Um, and then, so this is going to be a, a line of types, and then we're going to say by these equations that it's going between A on the left and B on the right. Okay, and so this is a um, relational version of the BCHG types. So it looks pretty much exactly the same, except that there's a relation instead of an equivalence. And so uh, that's why we're calling them gel types. Uh, all right. Now, I want to kind of compare the situation in the substructural theories, so BCH or what we're developing now, and the situation in the structural theories uh, as far as how you turn equivalences or relations into type lines. So the way things work in the Cartesian or structural setting, which would be the glue or V types, is that we'll have some, some line in the universe, or it could be something higher dimensional, but let's look at uh, a one-dimensional line. And what glue lets us do is attach some equivalences to the boundary of that line to produce a new line. So here what we've got, we've got this line A, and then we've adjusted its endpoints by some equivalences, E0 and E1, and the glue type will give us something that connects that bottom pair of types. Um, so this is, uh, Steve Audi calls this the equivalence extension property, so it seems like a good name. Um, and we can use this in particular to turn equivalences into types by uh, considering the case where the left and top uh, of this square are degenerate, where they're identity equivalences essentially. And what's uh, essential for that is that we know that a constant line corresponds to an identity equivalence. Um, so if you take a constant line and, and turn it into an equivalence, which you can do in in like ordinary Martin Love type theory, what you get out is the identity equivalence. And so it's possible to put something degenerate on the top there and just directly turn an equivalence into a line. Now in the substructural setting, do something a little different. We have this relation or equivalence or whatever that doesn't vary in a particular direction and we're converting it directly into uh, a line in the universe. Uh, again, with this kind of dimension shift. Um, and so that 
won't work in the Cartesian setting because we can't uh, talk about this uh, not occurring uh, property. Um, but also the, the structural version, the extension version, won't work for our relational purposes. And the reason for that is here a constant, uh, a constant bridge in the universe doesn't correspond to the identity relation necessarily. It corresponds to the bridge relation on that type. And a br the bridge relation on a type may not be the same as the equality relation on that type. In particular, bridges in the universe are relations, not equalities between types. Whatever equalities between types are, they're certainly not relations. So it's actually important that we do this, uh, this other construction, at least in the relational setting. I'm not sure whether something like glue types would work in BCH cubicle type theory. Um, okay, so that's the, the kind of options that we have. We're going with the latter one. Um, and so now we've got uh, our function in the, the right to left direction that takes relations and, and gives them, turns them into bridges in the universe. Uh, and what we now want is for our maps in either direction to form an equivalence. So we want the round trips to cancel each other out. And this is a little uh, uh, trickier than we might hope. And the way that it's resolved um, in the work of Bernardi, Cocan, and Moulin is to simply add equalities to the type theory that ensure it. Um, now, this doesn't, this isn't like um, a kind of axiom that will interfere with computation. Um, but it is rather a strict thing to require, and modeling it requires some work. So they give um, something which is sort of a pre-sheaf model, but it's a little more complicated in order to ensure that these uh, equations hold. Um, so they call this refined pre-sheaves. I think that this terminology is invented in this paper. Um, and uh, that works, but um, it has kind of, if I may uh, editorialize, a sort of um, the ad hoc flavor that you will always run into when you're trying to make some equality between types hold like strictly up to definitional equality. Um, and as uh, higher type theory aficionados, what we may prefer to do is have these be equivalences, which by univalence would give us paths between these things, which would then be enough to establish our, our goal equivalence. And so, that gives me an opportunity to introduce our work, uh, which is exactly combining um, the internal parametricity with cubicle type theory to, to give us a setting with both the parametricity and things like univalence and function extensionality, which we know and love. Um, so doing that is in fact quite simple. It's basically a matter of smashing things together. Where we once had one context, we'll now have two, the first, which are, um, bridge dimension variables and the second, which are path dimension variables. And um, again, we need to use these substructural variables for bridges, but that doesn't stop us from using structural variables for paths. And um, that's sort of what we prefer, both because it's just simpler and because um, some things like higher inductive types, we're not sure how to do in a substructural setting. Um, so structural is the easier choice for the cubicle side. Um, and then, there's really only one change that we have to make to the apparatus of cubicle type theory, which is a, a small change to the definition of con composition. Um, so what con composition uh, looks like in the particular cubicle type theory we're using, uh, which incidentally we're using the uh, Julie Favonia Harper uh, Cartesian cubicle type theory, but uh, as far as we know, you could drop in and replace that with the CCHM cubicle type theory, no problem. Um, but anyway, in the type theory that we're using, a composition looks like this. It's taking some term and then adjusting some pieces of its boundary by some other terms, these n sub i. Um, and the one thing we have to change is what kind of things are considered boundary uh, boundaries. So it's a, a, essentially we're um, picking co-fibrations to use the other kind of terminology um, or generating co-fibrations. I shouldn't uh, use words I'm not sure about, but anyway. Um, in the ordinary cubicle type theory, these are equations on path dimension variables. So maybe where x equals zero, I want to edit a bit, or where x equals y. 
What changes here, and this changes in order to ensure the bridge types are, uh, have a const structure, is that we can also look at a boundary given by an equation on bridge dimension variables, so where um, bridge variable x is equal to zero or something like this. Um, now, in that case, we don't need the diagonal equations, just the equals zero equals one equations. Um, it wouldn't really make too much sense to have the diagonal equations when we don't have diagonal substitutions, and we don't need them, so that will work for us. Uh, and in our paper, we describe a computational semantics for this, and if you know how to read that, which you might not, um, it's not too hard to see that it corresponds very closely to a pre-sheaf semantics where you just have pre-sheafs on the product of these two Q categories. And so we're able to avoid the kind of refined uh, uh, pre-sheaf trick because we're not trying to make those uh, equalities from before hold. And uh, so now let me get back to those gel types and, and flush them out a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna give some rules for introducing and eliminating uh, terms of the gel types. In the, uh, in the Bernardi et al. work, it actually, because you have this equation about gel types, you don't even need these rules, but we'll need them. Um, so this is uh, essentially straightforward. If you want to inhabit a, a gel type for a particular relation, you give two endpoints and then a proof that those endpoints stand in the relation. So here, M is in A, M is in B, and P says that they are uh, related by R. And then conversely, oh, not yet. And so this will give you a line over the gel type which connects uh, M on the left to N on the right. And then conversely, if you have an element of a gel type, um, so some line over this gel type, then I can extract a witness that the relation holds from it. So here I get uh, R holds of the left endpoint of Q and the right endpoint of Q. And so those two things go back and forth between the gel type and its relation. And so using it um, and some beta, eta composition rules, we'll be able to get that one inverse condition, which says that um, if I look at the bridges over a gel type, that corresponds to the uh, relation that I started with. Um, and in fact, we can also prove the other inverse condition from these rules uh, using, um, uh, well, various things. Uh, <laughs> there's a sort of analogy that I'm not sure how to make, but I feel must be possible to make uh, with a situation with univalence, um, where just having the ability to uh, turn equivalences into uh, paths with the glue types, you get out the um, both inverse conditions. Um, yeah, and I, I wanted to mention that also that the composition in the gel types is actually very simple um, as compared to like composition in glue or V types in, in cubicle type theory where that's the sort of most complicated part. The reason being that the principal direction of a composition is always a path. You can adjust um, a bridge by some paths, but you can't adjust a bridge by other bridges. Um, and so the sort of complicated case, which is where you're composing over a, um, a a line that is given by an equivalence doesn't um, come up here. You can't transport across a relation. Okay, um, so that's pretty much the uh, layout of the theory. And now I just want to talk about some uh, things we can do inside of it. So most of these are things that um, Bob and I are, are, have worked out in our preprint, sort of developing what you can do inside this theory. Um, but the first one already will make sense in, in the work of Bernardi et al., uh, just like a simple example to get us started. Um, and this is looking at terms of this type uh, for all x, x arrow, x arrow, x. So this is called the uh, type of church booleans because intuitively the only parametric terms of this type have to either always return the first argument or always return the second argument. So using parametricity, we hope to be able to show that there are only two such functions. Okay, um, and so how can we go about doing that? Well, let's suppose that we have some arguments to this function, some type X some and two terms uh, T and F. Then we can define a relation on X and the type of Booleans. Um, and we wanna say that A and B are related if either A is T and B is true or A is F and B is false. So we can uh, write that as this path type. 
says A is equal to, well, if B, then true, otherwise F, or T, otherwise F. Um, and then what we'll do is apply our function F that we have at the gel type corresponding to this relation R. So we're looking at the relational interpretation of this type and getting the fact that it holds for F, essentially. Um, so I've applied F here to this gel type, and then to two terms, which are witnesses to the fact that T, and tr T true and F false stand in this relation. T is related to true and F is related to false. And so that, the output of LX is, uh, the output, this term LX, is a term in the gel type. That's what the type says. And if we look at what its endpoints are, well, if we plug in zero for X, we're gonna get something in X. And so all these gels will step to their first arguments. And so what I get is FXTF. If on the other hand, I plug in one here, I get the second things, F bool true false. And so LX is a bridge over this gel type connecting FXTF to F bool true false. And now if I have a bridge over a gel type, I can extract the fact that its endpoints stand in the relation. So I ungel that and I get R of those endpoints, which says that there is a path from FXTF to if F bool true false TF. So what that term is saying is that if I look at F bool true false, if that's true, then FXTF has to be T. If it's false, then FXTF has to be F. Uh, so essentially the behavior of F uh, at any type is determined by the value of this one um, application F bool true false. And um, from that we can go forward and, and actually show indeed that this type of church booleans is equivalent to the type of real booleans. And that step uh, incidentally uses function extensionality. So we would want to be in the cubicle setting. Okay, so there's a, a sort of simple use of the theory. Um, now I wanna look at something related but different. Uh, I wanna look at the type of actual Booleans. And what I'm in particular interested in is um, what the bridges are in this type. Um, and so what I expect is that a bridge in Bool can only be a path in Bool. That the, the uh, relation corresponding to the constant type Bool is just the trivial uh, relation the, uh, or identity relation. Um, but I haven't put in some kind of uh, uh, extra rules for bool that says this is true, so I'm going to have to prove it just with what I've got. And so the way I'm going to go about this is first define a gel type which corresponds to the relation of paths in bool. So that's this gx here. And that has two canonical inhabitants, one that says that true is equal to true and one that says that false is equal to false. And next what I'll do is map from bool into gx by uh, a case analysis. So I have a function from bool to gx, which um, takes in some Boolean b, and if b is true, returns tx, and if b is false, returns fx. So that gives me a function like this. And now if I abstract over that x and, and apply pointwise, what I get is then a, a function from bridges over bool to bridges over gx. And so I'm being a little schematic here, but hopefully you can see the idea. And now we know that bridges over GX correspond to um, proofs that things stand in the relation corresponding to GX, which is paths and bool. So by uh, ungelling that, we get path and bool. So this gives us a function from bridges and bool to paths and bool. And now we can in fact show that again, this function is an equivalence. And what's kind of interesting about this is that it uses what uh, Bernardi et al call iterated parametricity. Um, and what that amounts to is um, gel types stacked in different directions. So you're dealing with two-dimensional relations, essentially. So this is sort of a, a benefit of, of working in not just one-dimensional relations, but higher-dimensional relations corresponding to the, the cubicle structure of the interval. Um, and I think there's an interesting parallel here to the situation in... in um, higher dimensional type theory where to characterize the path type of a, a higher inductive type, you use univalence. Here we're using the relational equivalent, the relativity principle in the form of gel types to characterize the bridge space of, a, of an inductive type. Okay, 
Um, and so what this means uh, in particular is that the Booleans are an instance of what we've been calling uh, bridge discrete types. Um, so there's always a map that takes paths in a type to bridges in a type. Um, because uh, in a constant, uh, bridges over a, a constant line are reflexive and everything respects paths. And so we say that a type is bridge discrete when this is an equivalence. And in fact, it suffices to give any equivalence and it will imply that this Lucin in particular is an equivalence. And um, these bridge discrete types play the role of something in uh, Reynolds or ordinary parametricity called the identity extension lemma, which essentially says that if I have a um, closed type with no type variables and I look at its relational interpretation, it will be the equality relation at that type. So that's not true for all of our types. In particular, it's not true for the universe, but we can single out the types where it is true and talk about that sub-universe. And then we can conclude some things that we would get for all types in ordinary parametricity. For example, any um, function from the universe to a bridge discrete type is constant um, because in the universe, there's a bridge between any pair of types given by the empty relation. And any function will take that bridge to a bridge in the codomain and if the codomain is bridge discrete, then that bridge turns into a path. So for any pair of, of terms in U, we'll get a path between their image. Um, and interestingly, perhaps, the subuniverse of bridge discrete types is closed under all the usual type formers except the universe, including the gel types. And since they're closed under gel types, what we in fact get is that uh, the subuniverse of bridge discrete types also satisfies this relativity principle. So you can do all the kind of parametricity arguments I've done in the regular universe, also in the bridge discrete universe. Um, and that property also holds for other subuniverses of general interest, like the universe of n types is relativistic. And oh, just to be clear, what I mean is that relations in the bridge discrete or bridges in the bridge discrete universe correspond to relations which are valued in bridge discrete types. Um, hopefully <laughs> you could follow that. Um, okay, and now here's uh, something we can do as a consequence of that. We can say something about the status of the excluded middle in the parametric theory. Um, so in particular, I wanna look at the weak excluded middle, which is the excluded middle for uh, negated propositions. So. Uh, negated types. So if I have any X and U, then either not X or not not X. Um, and what we can notice about this type is that if we have one of these, we can also get a function from the universe to the type of Booleans just by projecting out which, um, whether it was not inhabited or not not inhabited. Um, but we know from before that Bool is a bridge discrete type and that any function from the universe to a bridge discrete type is constant. So what this means is that if this will M exists, then it has to either say nothing exists or everything exists. And so that doesn't work because certainly the empty type and the inhabited type have to give different answers. So the weak law of the excluded middle is actually inconsistent with the um, parametric type theory. And uh, the sort of ordinary excluded middle of hot, which is excluded middle for propositions, is a more general case than will M. So that's also inconsistent. Um, and you can see this paper here for some other consequences of, of this fact. Um, and now I just want to do one last example. I think I'm rather low on time. Um, so one last example, which is what can we say about higher inductive types? Um, so here's the suspension of a type A. It has two points, north and south. And then for every element of A, it has a path which connects north to south. So this notation is, I have a, a meridian constructor, which is a path varying in whatever X I like, and at X equals zero, I attach it to north, at X equals one, I attach it to south. And so a natural question, example question we might ask is, what are the polymorphic functions from the suspension to itself? Um, so for all X, sigma X to sigma X. Um, and it turns out that the answer is, there are four of them, and they're determined by where north and south get sent. And so one way to put this is that they're determined by the value of k at the empty type, where you have no meridian constructors, you just have north-south. Um, and the proof of that is too complicated for me to give here, but it's not so complicated. And um, the key lemma in all of that 
is um, this property, which says something about how the suspension commutes with gel types that are the graphs of functions. Um, and this is a sort of a special case of what in parametricity is called the graph lemma, which says something in general about how types act on um, uh, graphs of functions. So that's something maybe to explore further. And so that's stuff we've done, uh, stuff that we'd like to do. Um, so you've probably been wondering what exactly uh, proofs in this system tell me about ordinary cubical type theory, because certainly like law of excluded middle is not refutable in cubical type theory. Um, and so it's certainly true that not everything transfers over, but we'd like to say that some things do. Um, so on the semantic side, there's at least one thing that you can see pretty simply, which is if you have some type expression in cubical type theory that doesn't involve function types, so it's sort of all covariant, then you can prove it in the bridge cubical type theory and, and still get an element in the cubical sets interpretation of ordinary cubical type theory. Um, but that's just sort of the lowest hanging fruit. We expect something a little stronger than that, but uh, we haven't really looked at it so far. And uh, in the, the prior work, this also hasn't really been considered. And on the syntactic side, we really have no idea um, what we can say. And then uh, as far as using it for something, um, what we'd like to try and do is use this to prove some algebraic properties of higher inductive types that at the moment are kind of hard to prove. So um, a while back we had Guillaume Brunery giving a talk about these um, commutativity, associativity, such properties of the smash product. Um, and so we might be wonder if we can somehow characterize polymorphic functions on smash products. So if I have a function which takes in n types and gives me a pointed function from its smash to its smash, maybe I can say that these, well, they look like they should either be constant or the identity function. And some of the, the coherence conditions that we want to establish on the, the smash product, like the pentagon and hexagon, can be um, expressed as saying that some round trip around some uh, polygon is an identity function. Now, if we know that it has to be either the constant or identity function, then we can figure out which one it is by testing it at some small type. So that's something we're hoping can be fruitful. And the status of this conjecture is that as of yesterday, I think I am pretty sure I can prove it fairly easily, but I thought that before, so I won't make any uh, real claims. Okay, so uh, I hope I gave you some idea of what's going on with internal parametricity and, and what it has to do with uh, the stuff that we're all so interested in. <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Evan. That was great. Uh, let me unmute everyone and we can applaud. Okay, so now we can open the floor to questions. Um, so if you have a question, just unmute your mic and ask away. Can you say some more about the last thing you said? Um, so about this conjecture? Yes. Uh, what do you want me to say about it? Um, I'm a bit confused what you mean that it's going to give you insight into the coherences. Um, so say that, um, uh, let's take a look at the um, Pentagon. So this is saying something about associating uh, smash product in, in different ways. Um, and it's, if we, uh, so this is I think like four types smashed together. And so if we know that all of those maps that we're uh, looking at the Pentagon made out of are equivalences, then it's enough to check that if I start at some point and I go all the way around in a circle, that I get the identity function. And I guess uh, you have to check both directions. But um, so that function that we want to check as the identity is something of this form on the slide, taking uh, any type and, and some smash of those things and producing some smash of them. Um, and so if we know that any such function we can write down uh, in the parametric type theory is either constant or identity, then to check that it's the identity, we just have to check that it's not constant. 
In order to do that, well, we can plug in the uh, uh, two-point type for each of these x's and look at where it sends the one thing that's not the base point. And so if it sends that to the base point, it's constant. If it doesn't, then it has to be the identity. Of course, whether that's relevant to cubicle type theory or, or hot depends a lot on um, that uh, the connection that we haven't really established yet, but hopefully we'll be able to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, so related to that, I guess, and this is really just on, on the connection question, and I, I was thinking not about just even, you know, cubicle sets, but just sort of, you know, normal topology land, right? Mm. Like, um, like, because when Reynolds developed parametricity, right, he generalized, you know, a fact that he observed in, say, the programming language C or something, right? It, it was right there. It's just there weren't models that showed it was there. Right. It was sort of an everyday. And so in, in everyday topology, is it sort of the case or, or not? I mean, you probably don't know that, you know, like, for example, with the, you know, is, is there just a purely sort of graphical, visual, uh, topological interpretation of uh, the suspension thing you had that would then be sort of familiar to a normal topologist in, in, in their everyday language that, and the sort of reasoning they might actually use? Um, well, not in complete generality. Um, I mean, the ordinary parametricity, parametricity is very much a um, feature of like the limits of lambda calculus. It's as much about what you can't express there as what you can. Um, and so, when you're internalizing the fact that you can't see something, um, then you're going from the absence of something to the presence of its refutation. And that limits what models you have. So it's for this reason that like, you can't just interpret all things in, in this parametric cubicle type theory into regular cubicle type theory. Um, so like basically any example I've presented is something that's not provable. In, in regular cubicle type theory. Um, and so it's a little different from uh, the non-internalized version, I think. But I don't know if I've really addressed your question. It, sure, I, 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 I guess my question could be limited in scope then to say that if, if one omits the fact that you can actually internalize this and, and exhibit it internally, mm -hmm. that, is there just a geometric interpretation that would be comfortable of, of the suspension thing? Like is there, there's four things you can four endo maps on a suspension or something right and you know th that that sounds very nice and geometric right so mm -hmm. so we yeah know that a topologist would recognize oh yeah those are the only four endo maps um well again i think that unless there's some sort of additional naturality property that you're you're imposing on your functions and and maybe just being a natural transformation is enough in that case um then no, um, but it is true that a lot of the things that I've been talking about probably could be done in a sort of um, a by just writing things in, in cubicle type theory and then using um, a separate relational interpretation that's not internal. Um, one thing that I think could be a benefit of doing it internally, and um, part of it is just that we were interested in, in pursuing this direction for other reasons, but um, one benefit I think might be that in this, it seems like in this theory, you don't have to build in what the relational interpretations of things are. And maybe it's a pain to uh, write down explicitly what the relational interpretation of a higher inductive type is, for example. And here, this seems to be something that we can derive from the relativity principle, which is uh, like essentially an internal thing. Um, and so that might be helpful. But yes, I think that um, the stuff does make sense without the internal version. More questions? So, as I understand it, you haven't got any semantics for this yet. So, um, Technically, no. It's it would be very straightforward to give a um, 
uh, semantics in pre-sheaves over the product of the Cartesian cube category and the, um, the BCH cube category. Um, and this would be pretty similar to what is done in uh, Emily and Mike's uh, paper on directed type theory, where it's two copies of, of the simplicial category or simplex category. Um, so I, I admit that I haven't worked that out uh, exactly, but I can say with some certitude that it will work. More questions. Uh, I'll ask one. So, um, the, the notion of parametricity is this related to being a natural transformation in some sense? I, I, you mentioned, you said that word. I'm just wondering, is there a connection between those concepts? Yeah. Um, so, it's definitely some kind of naturality with respect to relations rather than functions. Um, I probably should have reminded myself how to make that precise, but I didn't, so I'm afraid I can't say too much for you. Maybe somebody else uh, has the details in their head. That's okay. Um, I mean, there are open questions about whether you know, I think maybe for spaces, I'm not sure, but whether the identity functor has interest in natural transformations. Um, so there's, mm. there's, yeah. there's enough questions there and it would be interesting if there's a relationship. I think that this is, is discussed in that paper, this one at the bottom here, um, that kind of thing. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? It might have been, oh yeah. So, um, so some of these things, um, do really depend only on naturality with respect to functions. So I think that this conjecture, you can, if you just know that a term of this type is uh, natural in the X's, then you can, from that, conclude that it has to be constant or identity. So actually, most of the proof of that, if my, uh, if my proof works, can be conducted in ordinary cubical type theory if you happen to know that the thing is natural. Okay. Okay, any more? Last call. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Evan again. Okay, great. And so, yeah, thank you all for participating and thank you, Evan, for the talk. Um, our next talk is in two weeks, as usual, same time, and it will be Dan Licata. So I hope to see you all then, or see you on YouTube.